yeah, future grid technology trends. So let me just quickly go through what Seagra is. It's a global expert community for power systems. Really, it's a, a group of volunteer engineers from around the world that get together to solve common problems. It was formed in 1921, and uh, we've got our 100th anniversary coming up. Uh, this is, we've got 60 national committees, we've got 104 countries. Basically, if you've got a problem on anything relating to anything power, there's somebody in the world that's either had the problem and solved it, or has the same problem that you've got and hasn't solved it. And if they hadn't solved it, the aim is to get together with that person from around the world, form a work group, and solve the problem, which is then published, and uh, that information is disseminated everywhere. So this is really the aim of, of, of Seagray. This is the, 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 the structure, and why I've got this is that we've got a very small uh, management here. The, the, the staff in Paris is about 12 people. But from here down, we've got around 300 working groups of about 3,000 experts at any one time working on problems uh, currently within the power utility. And that goes uh, very wide from uh, communications, uh, overhead lines, uh, protection, ICT, cybersecurity, the whole thing. So this is really what it's about. These are the, you could call study committees, and here you can see information systems. Uh, we've also got materials, which was mentioned. Uh, this is your PVs. These are your markets and regulation. And uh, it's very interesting to see the trends coming out and we can learn from mistakes like they had in California, like they've got in Germany, and so on and so forth. And we can actually <laughs> then learn from that and uh, make sure we don't fall into the same problem. Now, really, what is happening with the power utilities? In the past, we used to have historical, we used to have rotational inertia. I'll get into that. Dispatchable generation, you could tell the, the, the power plant pick up or go down. We had passive and predictable loads and we had a static infrastructure. Where is it going to and where is it right now? Very reduced stability due to the renewables uh, coming in. And renewables we could call inverter-based uh, resources because there are renewables that are also fairly stable. But you're looking at stochastic generation. You don't know where the generator is going to be and you don't know how much it's going to generate and you don't know when it's going to generate. You've also got engaged consumers they're not only consumers, as was mentioned, they're now production consumers, and they also take part in the actual control of the grid if your market allows it. We've got a very adaptive uh, infrastructure, so you'll have some form of your infrastructure actually performing a certain role now and in a few hours' time performing another role. You've got uh, agile, precise control required for distributed generation, and at the end of the day, you're hoping for more efficient, reliable, resilient electrical systems. What does that mean? It means this is really where your ICT stuff comes in. Sensors, data acquisition, faster and real-time analysis. That's decentralized analysis. Algorithms, uh, more precise control, and so on. These, this here at the bottom is something which we need for controlling the system. And there you've got petrobytes coming through uh, on an hourly basis. So if you really want big data, that's, that's something that they're coming up to doing with the analytics now. This is how it was. You, you always used to have your generation going through transmission distribution to the customer. Um, and that wasn't that simple, but it was at least predictable. What does it look like now? You've got generation coming in at any point on the, on the network. So you've got, a, you've got the main generation, which is still in this area. Then you've got all your others coming in. And it can come in at any voltage. You can come in at this voltage, this voltage, this voltage right down to the customer side, as you know. So it's something, and the power flow can go this way or this way, which makes, a, which, which, uh, makes it extremely complicated and at different points at different times. <laughs> so what Seagrade did was they said, you need to look at, 10 things to make this whole thing work. And these 10 things have to be <coughs> um, in place and operated simultaneously. So if you forget one of them out, you ain't going to, the whole th pack of cards is going to fall down. And I'll concentrate on a few of them. Um, but the one that's most probably uh, in the news quite a lot is active distribution networks where you've got your PV on roofs and 
you've got uh, uh, generation at any point. But the rest of it, you can see, is also extremely important. And there's a lot of new concepts coming out for the protection of the system, which also involves ICT, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. And then there's new concepts for planning. Where do you put the lines? How do you put them in? Do you need lines? Um, there's a big talk about when uh, PV came onto rooftops that we actually won't need any transmission lines because everything will be local. Uh, however, what we're finding is that it's actually a mix of both. That you're actually finding you actually need these really long transmission grids because your areas where you can get the best renewables are not where the load is. And this was found in the US, where down in Texas they're finding that the the, uh, the, the gas supplies and the solar and wind are in fact in the desert areas uh, where there's no load. So they need to get it from there to the load. And then of course that's a huge challenge. Germany have got the exact same problem where they've got all the, the, the wind up in the north and the load's down in the south and they've switched their nuclear off which gives them the support in the south. So now they're trying to get lines through from the north to the south. They don't like overhead lines so they're going to put cable in. So they've got over a thousand joints on the cables and they don't know how they're going to keep that reliable. So you've got a huge challenge coming up as to whether it's uh, <laughs> overhead or underground or whether it's uh, local or distributed. Um, <laughs> just looking now at the active distribution networks, why they say active is because you've got generation within the distribution. Um, you need a lot more smartness. <laughs> uh, in other words, you need your smart grids, you need to know where the meters, well, where the power is going in and out, and you also need to know not only your watts, but also your support, all your support, um, your ancillary services, and I'll come out to what that is, because without ancillary services, you can't actually operate the power system. So the, you've got a, in, in areas where it was subsidized, in Germany, Australia, and so on, Denmark, you had a huge take up of PV on roofs. Obviously it makes sense. If you can sell for three times what you can buy, why, why not put PV on the roofs? In fact, in Germany, they said they'll only pay for PV on rooftops. So what they did was when they ran out of rooftops on their houses, they used to build roofs outside next to their houses with nothing underneath, but they had a roof. So then they put PV on that as well. So <laughs> they have a roof, they need a roof as there's somebody that lives in it. Um, but that was just one of the things, so enormous take up. Uh, and then you found that all the power flow went through the wrong way <laughs> from the, instead of from transmission distribution, went from distribution up to transmission. And uh, all the transformer settings and that were wrong, so they had to try and manage this huge power flow coming in the reverse direction at certain times when you didn't really need it. Uh, so you've, you've got to have, you've got, you've got to take into account this and, and the whole market design will determine your PV take-up on roofs. You've got to have smart metering and a four-quadrant smart metering so you know exactly what's happening, where the power is, where it's going. And again, that's a huge amount of data. And how do you manage that data is something that you need to look at. And then markets and regulation. The market design changes your entire who puts stuff on the roofs, who doesn't, who uses it, who sells, how they sell, and so on. If your market's not right, you can really mess up everything. Now, the next thing that we looked at here was massive exchange of information. Um, and the, the, the problem is that if you have no, uh, massive information, it's just as bad as having no, just as good or bad as having no information. Because you, unless you have a good user, somebody that knows exactly how to analyze that data, where to store it, uh, and what to do with it, uh, it, it's actually worthless. So you've got to be able to ensure that the data that you have is well structured, it's in the, right, in the right format, comes into the right analytics, and so on. And you need really to look at these new architectures. And one thing we found, of course, is that you'll never have enough bandwidth and you'll never have enough speed, because there's always new applications coming on. Um, and there's a large amount of data exchange between all stakeholders. And if you start now looking at your Distribution networks overseas, of course, they've got aggregators uh, which uses virtual power systems so they can actually inform the consumers as to whether to support voltage, frequency, or whatever. So you need that information. You need to know which consumers can do it for you, when they can do it, and then how to pay them. 
So there's a huge amount of data exchange. It's not just where the consumer is and, and, uh, and, and what he's doing. The other big thing, of course, as was mentioned, is cybersecurity right the way through. If they can hack into any of your stuff, not only to get your, 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 your customer data, they can actually wreck your entire grid distribution and your power distribution, so they can switch you off. Um, so this is, this is becoming a, a, an extremely important area. <laughs> the next one, of course, is operations and controls. And as was mentioned earlier, you've got now problem on power balancing, congestion, active and reactive reserve, and there's a lot of everything now is becoming more probabilistic rather than um, <coughs> static. Looking at your inverter, why I say inverter is because a lot of the, the hydro is actually not inverter based, but it's renewable. So if you look at inverter, that's because why I call it inverter because these, these are DC supplies and you need to convert it to AC, so you need an inverter. <laughs> um, so this is really what is wind and solar, and it's the fastest growing electricity source. I think you'd agree with that, you know, you, you know that. Now this is an interesting one. The, when you operate a grid, you need a score of five, which is green. These are the things you need to run a grid. So it's voltage, short circuit, inertia, primary energy, droop, regulation, following, spinning reserve, and so on, and black start, and you need green everywhere. Now, all the inverter bases are here. Okay, so you've got grid scale wind, grid scale PV, distributed PV, distributed battery. And you can see that in this side, you don't have much green, but where you have your coal, nuclear, hydro, green, okay. So now when you want cheap, if you, the, the, the inverter base will give you very cheap energy, which is great but it won't give you the rest of the stuff. So now you've got to try and have this matched with this. And that's really what, what the issue is. And a lot of the plans that do the modeling in the past to determine what generation you should actually use didn't take into account this because it was only using coal so, or gas. So it's all green, so you've got the full cake. Now you've, now you've got an energy source, such as wind, which will give you a bit of the flour, but no sugar and milk. So you've got to try and find out where you get the sugar and milk from. And it's not only storage when, it doesn't, when the sun doesn't shine, it's also all the other stuff. So how do you get that? The big problem is the inertial response. That's your spinning. So when, as soon as you have a, a blackout, you'll, your, your frequency won't drop too far. And that's what happened in South Australia where it dropped too far and it actually switched off and they had a huge blackout. Now, they've, now they're actually bringing in some coal, which is uh, rather crazy, but they're bringing in uh, 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 actual stations to give that inertia. Um, so this is something that you need to bear in mind. <coughs> and what is happening is that a lot of the uh, uh, studies at the moment are looking at how do we actually use this but can give us this. Because if you can do that, then you've got a win-win. So that's really what, we, what we're focusing on right at the moment. But it's something to bear in mind that when they say so many megawatts of wind, it's not a megawatt of wind. It's one aspect, one small part. If you've, got, you've got the energy, you haven't got the rest of the cake. Got to get, where do you get the rest of the cake? You get that, you sort it. So that's something to bear in mind. So a lot of batteries actually do a lot of the frequency response. And that's what happened with the Tesla battery in, in Australia, it gets very good frequency response. And you normally do, it's about 1% of your total, so you need about, for 40,000 megawatts, you need about 400, 500 megawatt of battery that will give you a good frequency response, but it won't give you the inertia. So the inertia, you need to actually drop your wind uh, output so that it can pick up very quickly and you can't have wind tripping off with high wind conditions, things like that. So this is what, this is what you need to bear in mind. <laughs> Just looking at what is storage, and you think, well, storage is all batteries. Not really. The global view, 98% of storage is, is uh, pump storage. And why is that? Because it it's can really give you 1,500 megawatts, switch that on extremely quickly, and it's got the full cake. It's got your inertia. It's got your fault levels. It's got everything. So it's likely to change slightly, but you can see that it's, it's actually to drop that even down to 50 or 60 as a percent is going to take a huge amount of other types of storage. And I'll cover the other storage that's coming on. But batteries are one of them, 
And uh, PV combined with storage, we're looking at about 21 gigawatt in the next few years. So it's not small, but looking at your total uh, use of uh, power around the world, it's actually, it's not that big. Um, now, just to go and to say, what are we looking at as far as technology is concerned? Don't want to cover too much here, but there's a lot of stuff that they can do. We can actually put submarine cables down to three kilometers now, which means you can go and link uh, Japan to Korea. You can link uh, all of Europe together, and I'll cover, that. I'll cover a little bit of what's been looking at that. But this is the kind of stuff that, that, that we're looking at. Um, one of the things that you need to look at really is your, is your market design. And if you, the, the, the problem at the start was the energy markets. Uh, and that didn't cover your ancillary service, and that pushed everything out. So your coals actually cold, closed down, your gas closed down, because it, they just weren't competing on the energy side. But then you had a problem on your, no one was building capacity, and no one gave you your frequency support. So this is very important. If you have a market, you've got to actually have all of these markets in place. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to operate your grid. <laughs> and this is just something that they're looking at now. If we can get renewables around the world, somewhere around the world, the wind will always be blowing, the sun will always be shining. If you can get that energy with all the rest of the cake into the positions, you can actually then supply <coughs> renewable energy uh, globally. And this, this sounds a bit crazy, but there is a, a state grid of China, in fact, are very big on looking at this kind of thing. And why China? Because of all the renewable uh, facilities up in um, Mongolia and here, in this area here. Um, so you'll, you'll find what they're looking at here is you can see lines from China through into Korea, through into Japan. And up, and this is actually feasible, technically feasible. So they're, they're looking at doing that. Now, Seagrave actually looked at something even bigger, which is a global grid. And what they're saying is that if you can get hydro here, you can you can take power through here. This is this is the area of huge wind power in this area here. <laughs> and you're looking here at really, really long lines, but technically feasible. We've actually done cost studies on this as well to see which links can actually operate. Now, you might say that's crazy, but China doesn't seem to think so. They build an ESKIM every year, so they think, well, what's the problem? Um, so it's, it's something which is, I think, most probably a little bit of a pipe dream at this stage, but they are looking at little regional areas like at Asia to see if they can't start it up. So it's something to keep to bear in mind. And this is one of the links. You know, considering we have uh, around about uh, 40,000 megawatt total, uh, our load's about 30,000. This is one line running at 12 gigawatts from this particular area here all the way into Guangdong. And this is a renewable source and uh, 3,300 kilometers. And this is the actual, there's a guy sort of standing here. This is the actual transformer with the bushing at the actually operating on this thing. So technically advances are looking at these things now becoming a lot more feasible than they were a few years ago. Now the next thing that I think is one of the big disruptors, you've got a huge amount of renewables and so much so that in Germany the uh, renewables, in fact, uh, the cost of energy went negative, which was great for the neighbors because they paid, the Germans paid them to take their power and it went to Austria and they used it to pump up their water on their pump storage and then they waited until Germany really needed the power and they sold it back to them. So you had a huge profit. <laughs> but what does this do now? This can actually, you can now start using renewable surplus to generate hydrogen. And once you do generate hydrogen, you can run fuel cells. The problem with the fuel cells, with the batteries at the moment, is that for trucks, all the truck will be doing is taking the battery around because it's too heavy to actually put any, any load on it. But with the fuel cells, which are modular they, it's, and small, you can, you can refill it in three to five minutes and you can then run it. So this is something which in Seagrave, we've actually set up a separate group just to look at the development of this. And uh, it's really the production of hydrogen using renewables through the fuel cell into the electricity grid. 
and you can also you use water electrolysis and you can they've got some really they, the prices are really coming down on this electrolysis to produce hydrogen <coughs> and this is something they're looking right now in the grand vision of the north sea 80 gigawatt wind hub which they are now looking to supply all around europe with hydrogen either in cables or with hydrogen pipes and this is this is ongoing right now um, so it's something which I think if you're looking at another disruptor, renewables, hydrogen will give you storage, take over the transport. They've got trains running on the fuel cells, forklifts, trucks, everything. It's, this, is, this is something I think which is something to really look at. So in conclusion, really we, I think if we think renewables are going to go away and we're going to go back to the coal, I think you're dreaming. I just think the costs are going to change that entirely. Uh, your load generators will be interchangeable, mobile and variable. If you've got EVs coming in, they'll generate into the grid. Uh, your power flow will be uncertain. Markets will distort the power. And I think in South Africa, we need to really start looking at markets. You want something coming in for investors, get your markets, but be very careful how you design your markets. Um, hydrogen economy is likely to be the next disruptor because of the, the, the speed, the modular uh, designs of that and the ability to store the energy within hydrogen. Um, but it's a great opportunity. So you've got few further studies in business models, revenue protection, product development, blockchain, uh, grid planning, design operation, protection, AI. If you get into the power industry now, you can almost do anything. It's, just, it's, so, it's so wide. So... Enjoy the future. Thanks. Just acknowledgement to Eskim and that technical council who helped put the production together. Mm -hmm.